want to know what the entertainment business is going to look like 10 years from today? Well, good. You're in luck then, because I am about to tell you. I normally don't get too caught up in predicting the future. I do occasionally make informed prognostications, which are correct, I believe, 99.3% of the time at last count. Yeah, 99.3. But when I do that, it's nearly always because, you know, I see history rhyming. But as far as crazy things that come out of left field that most people never saw coming, I usually don't see them coming either. But here I'm going to indulge myself and put on my futurist hat for a moment. Because I do believe firmly that the way entertainment content is made and consumed is going to be fairly radically different a decade from today than it is today. So these writers who are currently on strike, they are more doomed than typewriter manufacturers were on the day they invented email. Human writers of filmed entertainment simply are not going to exist by the mid-2030s, at least not in the same form that they do now, because I'm here to tell you these AI bots are closer to making human writers redundant and obsolete than any human writer would ever care to admit. We might not even be five years away from the point where you can open up your little AI screenwriter app and type in, give me a John Ford Western, 212 pages in length, and then you step out to grab a coffee, and when you get back, it's finished. And 80% of what it gives you, you can go shoot a movie with right now. If a human writer is required at all, It'll just be for polishing, not for any of the mainline writing, because reality is what reality is. Let's face it, in a world where a hundred dollar piece of software can deliver the same movie script that used to cost a couple million bucks and take an indeterminate amount of time and an unknown number of rewrites, you'd have to be an idiot to keep doing it the old way. And no labor union can stop the march of progress, no matter how doggedly they try. It's true when the plumbers union in Philly tries to ban the installation of maintenance-free urinals, and it's true when the writers union in Hollywood tries to ban robots from writing movie scripts. And the word on the street is, it's the poor oppressed actors who are going to be going on strike next in protest of whatever it is that actors find oppressive, but they're so good at portraying themselves as victims, I'm sure they'll figure something out. Being able to fake cry on command will probably come in pretty handy too, who knows? But, but here's the thing about the actors. They've got exactly the same problem the writers have. They are also going to be replaced in the very near future, but where the writers will be replaced solely by robots, the actors will be replaced with a combination of robots and zombies. Because the new Indiana Jones movie, Indiana Jones and the Cleavage of Calamity, I believe it's called, though it has already cemented its status as the most horrific box office disaster in the history of moving pictures, there is one aspect of it that has been pretty close to universally well received, and that is the digital de-aging job that they did on Harrison Ford. The whole first act is digitally de-aged young indie, and from what people are saying, while there still is a bit of an uncanny valley effect, it's pretty close to being eliminated. And based on how much improvement there has been in the technology in just the seven years between Rogue One and today, give it another seven years and you will be able to reanimate any movie star in history at any age of your choosing. So if we are all sitting here in the summer of 2033 and zombie John Wayne and zombie Marilyn Monroe are starring together in the blockbuster hit of the summer written and directed by the robot ghost of John Ford and the year's top grossing concert tour is Hologram Elvis co-headlining with the Hologram Beatles, just don't forget you heard it here first. Jim Eagle hit the damn music. <laughs> From high atop the battlements of Castle Curmudgeon, where Hunter Biden's cocaine blues has just passed 30,000 views so you can eat your heart out, Jason Aldean. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all ships at sea. Welcome to the program. I am your eponymous host and humble servant. And speaking of movie stars, is there any actor working today? Hell, is there any actor living today that you can point to and say, that guy is not only a great actor, not only a gigantic star, but he is also one of the best men this country has to offer. In the judgment of this reporter, the last time you could say that was on the 2nd of July, 1997, when James Maitland Stewart, Brigadier General, U.S. Air Force, passed away at the age of 89. If you're someone my age or younger, you probably only know Jimmy Stewart from watching It's a Wonderful Life on Christmas Day, if at all. 
Even if you're a movie fan, people in the current day probably only know him from, from that and just a few other films. Uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Rear Window, Vertigo, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. But Jimmy Stewart was one of the most well-liked and bankable stars in Hollywood for basically the entirety of three whole decades, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He was also a full-on badass fucking war hero. As any man can claim to be who has completed 20 combat missions as a B-24 squadron commander. Now, a lot of famous actors and athletes, British and American alike, served with honor and distinction in the Second World War. And when I say that, it is not taking anything away from the actors who served in the propaganda film units and the ball players who served by playing in exhibition ball games. Their service was just as honorable as the guys who went to combat. They went where they were ordered and they did what they were told to do. And hey, if you have no useful skills Aside from acting or ball playing, the army has to find something to do with your ass, right? Now, James Maitland Stewart of Indiana, Pennsylvania did not suffer from the problem of no useful military skills. And he also didn't wait for Pearl Harbor to volunteer for the service, which sets him apart from every other American film star who served in the war. And yes, you heard that right. Jimmy Stewart enlisted for, in the Army Air Force in February of 1941, nearly a year before Pearl Harbor. When public opinion was overwhelmingly against us becoming involved in the war, and most people still thought we would be able to stay out of the thing altogether. Jimmy Stewart was 33 years old and has, had just broken through as one of the biggest stars in the game. He made Mr. Smith Goes to Washington in 39, followed by the Philadelphia Story in 1940, and with his country not even at war, he quits the business to enlist in the army. And that's right, I said enlist. He didn't get an officer's commission right off the bat, even though he was a highly experienced pilot already and thus had skills that were very much in demand. But he had to enlist as a private, because according to the letter of the law, he was far too old to begin army pilot training. Plus, he was under the minimum weight requirement. So they almost didn't even let him enlist. They turned him away one time for being too damn feeble and underweight, then he went back a second time, and he bribes the guy on the scale to put his thumb on there and, and give him a little help getting across the finish line. And that was probably the most dishonest thing Jimmy Stewart did in his entire natural-born life. So to recap, you've been scraping by as an actor for nearly 10 years, not making much money, always just one misfortune away from being utterly ruined and having to go back home to the farm. And then it all comes together for you. You're at the top of your profession, finally living the dream toward which you have striven these long years. And then you quit to become an army private. Why? Because you think you have a moral duty to serve your country as your fathers and your grandfathers did. Because we might be going to war and you have valuable skills that you feel obliged to contribute to said cause. Now show me any A-list actor today who would even contemplate doing something that honorable and selfless. And when you can't, I will show you a big part of the reason why there are no movie stars anymore. Because I got a pro tip for you, kids. Being good at acting is only one component of the equation. Being a star in the true sense of the term also means being a man who has qualities that people would like to emulate, and not just on the screen, in real life, too. It wasn't until the fall of 41, when relations with Japan had further deteriorated, and it looked ever more likely that war was on the horizon that the army decided they should probably give Private Jimmy Stewart an officer's commission and get him into an airplane as quickly as possible. But because he was made to start out as an enlisted man, he wound up being the only guy in the U.S. Army to rise from Buck Private at the start of the war to Bird Colonel at the end. Which brings us neatly along to the Jimmy Stewart movie I want to talk about tonight. Strategic Air Command, 1955, co-starring June Allison, whose voice I still can't hear without think of, thinking of adult diapers, which I guess is a function of having grown up in the 80s. It is not one of the better-known Jimmy Stewart films, hell, it might not even be in the top 20, but it gives us, I think, a great set of insights into the man himself and not just the actor. In Strategic Air Command, Stewart plays Dutch Holland, third baseman for the St. Louis Cardinals and decorated World War II bomber pilot gets called back to active duty status because the Air Force, as it is now, has an acute shortage of combat experienced bomber pilots. And since this story is set in 1953, 
shortly after the end of the Korean War. It's also a snapshot of a very particular moment in the history of the Cold War, between the advent of the hydrogen bomb and the advent of the ICBM, and also during the brief just couple of years window when we had the hydrogen bomb and the Russians didn't. So if there was ever a moment during the Cold War where the strategic balance was decidedly in our favor, it was probably during the time in which this picture is set, because we're counting our blast yields in the megatons now, boys and girls, and the other guys, they're still in the kilotons. But we've still got no better delivery system for these things than freaking airplanes dropping gravity bombs. See, when most people today think of a Cold War missile launch, they think of one of two things. Either a guy in an underground silo pressing a button to launch the ICBM, or a guy on a submarine pressing a button to launch the ICBM. But that stuff all doesn't come along until the 60s and 70s. If there was going to be a nuclear exchange in the 50s, it was going to be dudes in airplanes dropping bombs on enemy population centers. And in a world where the hydrogen bomb exists, a whole new level of military precision and attention to detail is required. As Jimmy Stewart's character talks about in the movie, he says, This bomber I'm flying here in 1953 carries more destructive power than all the bombs dropped by everybody in the last war put together. And that gives a fella a lot to think about. Now, a lot of actors have gotten knighthoods, peerages, presidential medals of freedom, Kennedy Center, Center honors, and what have you. Only one actor was ever a general. And when he was shooting strategic air command, aside from the baseball thing, Jimmy Stewart was basically playing himself in real life. He was a colonel in the Air Force Active Reserve, and he was actually rated to fly the two aircraft his character flies in the film, the B-36 and the B-47. If there's anything I recommend most highly about this picture, which doesn't really have much of a story to speak of, it has to be said. It's the aerial photography, which is just indescribably gorgeous, and it's difficult to believe it could be achieved with the equipment they were using in 1955. And I continue to marvel at the fact that, as far as the pictures that were shot on good wide-color film stock, movies from 65 and 70 years ago look so much better than movies today, it is really quite absurd. But there's one shot where we're looking at an aerial refueling sequence from the perspective of the guy in the tanker who's operating the boom, and I've got no idea how they fit that big-ass camera into the ass end of that airplane. But what a great achievement, and I'm hard-pressed to think of any picture where I have been more impressed with the aerial photography sequences. And such great footage of, of airplanes that are so obscure. Now, if you had asked me to picture a B-36 a few days ago, I'm not sure what I would have pictured. But it wouldn't have been a thing that looks like a like a winged submarine with six backward-facing turboprops and four jet engines outboard of those. This plane is so ugly, it might as well be Russian. But during that brief window where we needed a strategic nuclear bomber but the B-52 didn't exist yet, this ungainly beast was just about all we had. And how awesome that all of this great footage of it was shot. The B-47, on the other hand, that thing doesn't have a problem looking good. That's about as close to a hot rod as a jet bomber can get. Jimmy Stewart's character treats it like it's a clear upgrade, and, and I think we'd be safe in assuming the real-life Colonel Stewart felt similarly inclined. And speaking of that, since we keep adding to this man's list of singular distinctions, let's keep going. How many actors do you know who have had to go down in rank to play their character? In the first act of, of Strategic Air Command, Dutch Holland is a lieutenant colonel, and the actor portraying him is a bird colonel. <laughs> now, are there things about this picture that are easy to make fun of? Yes, of course there are. Starting with the title song, which when you hear it, you're going to think, oh yeah, this is that song they made fun of in all those 80s movies. I mean, realistically, that song was probably a little bit corny, even in its own day. And, and not to mention the idea of a female lead making a priority of supporting her husband's career. That would just be seen as wildly offensive and anti-feminist in in our new and more more enlightened age. In fact, you'd, you'd be laughed out of the room within five minutes if you tried to pitch this script in 21st century woke Hollywood. It's about a man who willingly gives up wealth and celebrity to serve his country when called upon. And he's played by a man who willingly gave up wealth and celebrity to serve his country when called upon. All right, kids, stop pulling my leg. What, what's the picture really about? 
What's all this rah rah America bullshit? You're just joking, right? Are there any here? Are there even any black lesbian vampires in this picture? And that thing about your male lead, yeah, that's really like an actor would ever do that. His career would never recover, you idiot. But when you watch Strategic Air Command, you get a really strong sense that Jimmy Stewart isn't just making a movie here. In a certain sense, he's almost inviting the viewer into his workplace. There's a scene about a third of the way through the thing where we spend a good 11 or 12 minutes just shooting the shit with the guys on the crew, one of whom is Harry Morgan, for you MASH fans out there. And it's probably not unlike the sort of conversation that the real-life Colonel Stewart might have gotten up to with his real-life bomber crew on the weekends. It's also way too easy, with decades of hindsight, to, to kind of smirk at the Cold War and the attitudes that accompanied it, because we already know the movie ends without any global thermonuclear annihilation. But this picture is very clearly directed against the public perception that existed at the time that we were on a peacetime footing and our bomber crews were just sort of flying around joyriding in circles all day long. In actual point of fact, these guys were on a war footing 24 hours a day. They were under tremendous amounts of stress. They had to constantly live with the burden of knowing just a small mistake on their part could mean millions of people perishing in a blazing inferno of death. And sure, it would be all too easy for a cynical 21st century viewer to smirk at the earnestness of it all, the saccharine simplicity of it all, people serving their country out of a sense of duty, people treating their marriages like sacred life partnerships, people taking pride in the quality of their work. Come on, man, nobody wants to see that shit. People want gritty realism and handheld shaky cam. Lots of handheld shaky cam. And when General Jimmy Stewart passed away on the aforementioned 2nd of July, 1997, we still lived in a country where a Democrat president would say nice things about a Republican who just died. And that day, President Bill Clinton said the following, quote, America lost a national treasure today. Jimmy Stewart was a great actor, a gentleman, and a patriot. We will always remember his rich career of great performances that spanned several decades and entertained generations of Americans. Like all Americans, Hillary and I will miss him greatly, but his works live on, and for that we can all be grateful. Close quote. If he had never acted in a single motion picture, James Stewart would be one of the best men the United States of America ever produced. But he did act really damn well in lots of motion pictures, many of which are culturally indispensable. So next time you have a couple hours to kill, before you turn on Woke Superhero Dog Shit, Volume 49... Maybe do yourself a favor and watch a Jimmy Stewart picture you've never seen before. Thanks very much indeed for watching. Have a great day and a pleasant tomorrow. See you next time. Do not comply. Get off my lawn!